First of all, I'd like to say thank you for coming out. I know this is a real task for college students to do anything after class. You know, you shouldn't be here. I understand that. Um, <clears throat> also, with them talking and talking about 40-year retrospectives and so forth, you know that I'm pretty old, actually. <laughs> I'm not a spring chicken up here, so I want you to understand that I might fall asleep on you or something during this lecture, but you understand it's just a, one of those age things, you know. <clears throat> but what we have up here with, um, we are holding Mrs. Cleaver for ransom. That I had what was known as my abduction series. And it, it just so happened, I happened to be um, in a hotel in San Francisco at, um, on some art and science field trip or something from the school district or something. And I was in the hotel, you turn on the TV, of course. And uh, someone had been abducted and there was this awful image. It was real, ooh. All right, they put it on me. It, um, <laughs> there was this awful image of uh, this person that had been abducted and I just, I just right there snapped it off the TV. And what preceded this was a painting that I had, and, and when I came back, I made this painting that I called, that was the beginning of my abduction series. And um, a friend of mine had a restaurant, and um, I asked him, he asked me, did I want to put some work in there? And, and of course, I put the abduction painting in there, and shortly after that, I got a phone call, you know, he says, hey, Floyd, I got to take the abduction painting down, you know, he says, too many customers are complaining, you know, it was a place to eat, you know, and, and so soon after that, I called it my diet painting, because I had to go remove the painting, nobody, you know, I got so many complaints from that painting, and it was awful to be in a place where you want to eat some food, it would spoil your appetite, and then later on, I, I did this larger piece from my abduction series, and we were holding Mrs. Cleaver for ransom. It had gone beyond just individuals, but through that period, abductions were happening all over, and this was when they were first starting to abduct hostages and so forth all over the world. And that's basically what we are holding Mrs. Cleaver for ransom means, is that they were holding the United States of America for ransom. And you know when that started in the late 80s and moving up through there. Uh, the, the raw deal, I mean, that, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the raw deal is basically that when you look at all the statistics and you look about education and wealth and so forth and so on, we're all always, all the people of color are always on the bottom of the rung, you know that. Uh, we have the highest unemployment rate. We have the highest this, the highest that. We're never on top of that ladder, so we're always getting the raw deal, basically, and that's what that emphasizes. <clears throat> um, as far as you can see that the simplification is starting to happen where you're starting to look for more imagery that has more, um, I have to convey that I am influenced, you, the, the title, Son of Pop, um, when I was in high school, that my directions, when we first started off, it was very classical and, you know, all that nonsense that went with learning how to paint and draw and so forth. And um, I thought everything was like the Renaissance. I thought all art was like the Renaissance until eventually I, uh, I found books on Andy Warhol, Robert Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns, and so forth. And I realized that there were other avenues to do work besides the work that we were doing in school. And it's from that influence, the pop influence, that a lot of my work comes out. But I'm not, I'm not just talking about a popular society or um, our mass consumption or anything like that. I'm basically taking that imagery, and a lot of times there are icons that you're familiar with, and bring them up because you are familiar with them. And so you approach the work with some familiarity, and then I try to throw some little hook in there to upset you or to bring you into the realm that I'm trying to convey to you. And sometimes they're like pop images. And I think like Raw Deal is really a solid image. The, the African American hanging by the flag, and I know it's been done many times. One of my favorite artists, David Hammond, um, early in the 60s, he had 
plenty of works where he was doing his body paintings and uh, images, and he there's there's plenty of images of African Americans being strange fruit. But this is my particular version, and I did it on a scale. And there are other versions of the raw deal in multiples and so forth, silk screen, using those mediums and techniques that Andy Warhol and so forth used, but using them for making social statements. <clears throat> uh, now we're bucking into um, the Nubians and the wrestlers. And I mean, I think the Nubians are still like, um, I don't know dates of my work anymore, hardly. I, I mean, I got a lot of work, and I can't remember all the dates, but I can kind of remember the periods. Uh, that would be in the 90s. And the wrestlers would be in, what, 2010 or something like that? Yeah. But the, it's, it's all based on, basically, um, the Nubians. You know, you're in, you're in Sudan, basically. And when we, uh, the Nubians, the warriors themselves, every day, every day they, they change their body paint. And I mean, they have these fascinating colors and patterns, and that's what the warriors do. And their big thing is wrestling. Um, if you can wrestle and you're a Nubian, you're, you're a star. And that's where basically the wrestlers come from. And I mean, that's a long ways off from the Nubians, but it's still connected. Basically, you know that the first George Bush is the one that actually discovered oil over in the Sudan. So when you see that blackness dripping under there, that's representative of the oil. And you see the two wrestlers that are fighting, because it's always from the north and the south, that are fighting over that oil. And you always have some other culprits that come into play that have a lot to do with politically how that is uh, assuaged. So that's what the... Um, the um, Nubians and the wrestlers have in common actually is that they're portraying the aspects of the Sudan or you could even put it in a broader aspect of Africa and you know the way colonialism is with the oil and so forth I mean they pretend like they're free and stuff but they have vast vast resources and always have because you know they've always divided up Africa for their resources they could give a crap about the, the people. They want the resources. OK, here we have the universal bunnies and the ancestors. And universal bunnies is, is it comes from that old slang of uh, jungle bunnies. That's what, you know, we have a lot of names that they call us. And I won't repeat all those names because you probably know some I don't know. and. Basically, the Universal Bunnies is conveying that, yeah, you guys want to pretend like we're not part of this, but we're very much part of this. We've always been very much a part of this. It's, it's wonderful to assume that we don't have another aspect of life, because always, usually what you hear about are those on the lower level, but we're very, very well embedded in society. I mean, Universal Bunnies means that African Americans or people of color we don't see ourselves always as some disparate or some, some outlier of the American culture. We're very much a part of it. We, we built this country. Uh, we're still participating. We're still here. We're not going anywhere. And we have aspects of our society. As you see here, I've, we have a, a doctor and we have a patient. And these kinds of situations and scenes go on every day in African American life, just like anywhere else. Um, there's other series of that, and it just really shows that we are part of this, we're embedded in this, we're not going anywhere, and we're going to be fighting and giving you hell until it's over, basically. The ancestors, everybody knows what the ancestors, your ancestors are those that are looking over you, the ones that have left and are still guiding you, being your guardian angels, uh, uh, the ones that have influenced you, have given you all that wisdom, um, guidance, uh, those are your ancestors. Uh, I'm not trying to make them look like they're some kind of godly beings because to us they're just regular people. They're the ones that was your grandmother, your aunts, your uncles. 
that cousin that always came drunk to the party. Those are your ancestors. I mean, you, you've, you have picked up things and learned things from them, and they still you know, impart things on us. So those, that's just a very simple image of still using that image that I use in the universal bunnies with the ancestors, because we're just, they're just universal ancestors, if you want to call them that, for us. And that's about it. OK. Thanks, Floyd. We, when we were, you can probably bring the lights up if you want. Um, one, uh, one time toward the end of the show in Colorado Springs, Floyd and I were taking uh, a collector through the show. And um, it didn't take him long. I mean, we weren't even halfway through the show. Right. And this, this is a pretty articulate guy. And he made a comment, something along the lines of, well, this looks like a different artist every time we look in a different direction. And then he kept saying it again and again and again. This is, no, this, and, until it's, it's, started sounding like a, like a, a, just an absolute to him. No, this is a different artist. This is not the same artist. And, and it, I, I, we, we never have quite figured out what he was on about, but it was quite clear that somehow he couldn't get his head around what he was experiencing, and he couldn't bring himself to a place of finding those connections. All he saw was the, the very surface qualities of, of things. And now, you, 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 there are always these paradoxes. I mean, this is a guy who'd actually bought one of, one of Floyd's pieces. Uh, and then, and then uh, you know, one of those great benefits in my world, he then donated it to the, to the Fine Arts Center for our collection. But um, it, it's an interesting kind of response. And so we've been very, I think, interested in sort of pulling those threads and, and seeing where they kind of where they kind of come out in different ways. And so um, now, having seen uh, some images of the work, uh, we'll take some questions from you all. And those are very Anyone? few images, and I don't yeah. know if they impart anything that would even engender a question, but I'm sure you have some questions, and I'm willing to answer. Yes? Um, it's not a question, it's actually a statement. statement. I don't know if I always have an answer for every question that someone has or when they ponder the work because um, we all come from disparate backgrounds. We all have a different social economic matrix. You know, we don't grow up the same. We have different input, but everything we see visually, that's us. I mean, whether we're an artist or not, you don't know. I mean, our world is just becoming more visual all the time, too, because, you know, you don't even have to read to cross the street. I mean, it used to be walk and don't walk now. It's just a symbol and some numbers. You know, you got a certain amount of time to get over there, and that's it. But it, there's no, you know, there's not language up there except visual language, and that is a language in itself. Uh, when they had the Olympics, you know, that's, that's international. They're not going to put all the languages up there. They just put symbols of you go to swim in here, your gymnastics is over here, and so forth. But those are just symbols. But people understand symbols, and people understand visual things. Now, I think we also have common denominators, too. You know, as hum humanity, we always have common denominators. We, you might be Puerto Rican, I may be black, but we probably have more in common than we don't, you know? And that's the same probably for everybody out here. That's what everybody, you know, always 
stresses the, the things that we don't have in common, but we, I think we have more things in common. Uh, when you think about somebody not understanding the work, I understand that. Um, from my background, I don't have any choice. Um, I come from a family of 10 kids. I'm like the seventh one. My dad left when I was like in second grade. My mother raised all of us. Um, so my experience was, was quite different. I was lucky though because I had an older brother that was an artist and he was my mentor. I would go sit on the couch and look over his shoulder. I learned how to paint, I learned how to draw just from observing him. And then I, my sisters, my mother, everybody, my mother, she would take me out in the summer times trying to get me in art programs. Well, you know back, if you know my age, back in the early 60s and the late 50s, early 60s, there weren't a lot of art programs. I'm coming from Denver, Colorado. Now, Denver was a big cow town back then, and most people could not wait to get out of there. But we, we went all over town on the bus looking for art programs, never found them, always crafts, you know. And even at that, that age, I knew I didn't want to do crafts. I wanted to be an artist, you know. I wanted to, I idolized my oldest brother. That's what I wanted to be. That's what he was doing. That's what I was going to do. I didn't want to go put popsicle sticks together and all that crap that they were doing in the craft shows. You know, that wasn't me. I wanted to go learn how to draw and paint and so forth. Okay, based, based on that, I had other people that helped me. I had a friend of mine who gave me his, well, the story goes like this. I was, my mom, I was in the corner of the dining room, right? And you guys know the old days, you didn't change your curtains no every year or anything like that with the seasons. When you got some new curtains, those were the curtains until they weren't new. You know, they were right. So my mom had the dining room, she had the new curtains. And you know, Floyd Tunz is a little budding artist. I, I learned how to oil paint, right? I set up my easel in the corner and stuff. I'm over there and I'm painting. I'm, I'm cooking in the house, you know, I'm painting. Paint splattering off the edge of the canvas onto those new curtains, right? Well, my mother said, look, look Floyd, I, I know you're trying to be an artist and I'd like to support you, but you don't have to find some place else to do this. You know, you're not gonna be able to do this today because now I gotta replace those curtains, right? That's a major investment, you know? I gotta replace, so a friend of mine, he says, okay, I'm gonna give you your first studio, I'm gonna give you half of my garage. And I went up and that's where I started and half of my garage every place after that, through college or wherever, wherever I was was my studio. I would just take billboard paper or whatever it is, put it all over the walls, all over the floors. If there was an extra room in the apartment or something, that was the studio. When I moved to Colorado Springs, I lived in an apartment first, but I, I had a studio, I always had a studio. And what I would say to you is you always have a studio, you always do the work that's germane to you, and you can't worry about those other voices. If you worry about those other voices, you won't do anything. <laughs> yes. So, I've got oh boy. Not, not the two-parter. She's going to take me out, you guys. Watch out. <laughs> Uh, no. No, I don't consider myself a storyteller. I can say that in some of the work there's narratives. There's a, most of the work when it's political, there's a protagonist. You know, but, and, but I don't consider myself a story. I consider myself an artist. I consider myself that person that does something visual that everybody else is bringing their baggage to to understand or to make a point. And if it's not the same point that I'm trying to convey, but they pick up something else, my whole point is you don't care if they hate the damn work or they love it. You just don't want them to be indifferent. If there's no response to it at all, the work is dead. Go back to the drawing board, go back into the studio, go do whatever you want. But I'd like to, for people to emote to what I'm doing. 
because that's what I'm doing when I'm doing it. So if I can reciprocate somebody emoting to the work, that's enough. But to consider myself a storyteller, I don't think I'm a really good storyteller because I'm too eclectic. I'm too disparate. I think the work, most people look at it and say, oh, your work is all over the place. Well, not really. But there's a lot of things to be discussed. There's a lot of things to address. I'm that person that, if you're doing it, I can tell you right now, a friend of mine gave me great advice. He says, Floyd, you might be the best artist in the world, but you better get something to fall back on. <laughs> and I know that's why you all are going to school right now, because there's many budding artists out here, I'm sure there is, but you better get something to fall back on, okay? And teaching for me was that. Teaching allowed me to do the art that I'm doing right now. And everybody thought that I had to wait until I retired to do the work. Not at all. I was working before I even started teaching. And then when I started teaching, it allowed me, you know, it used to be teachers used to have three months off for the summer. Really, three months. Not that little 10 week vacation they have now or whatever. And so you work all year like a madman, and then you got your summers to really build up a body of work and get some momentum. And usually that momentum would take you all the way through the autumn. And then you're good for, you know, it takes you through the, the rest of the year. And then you really can really work and concentrate on your summer vacation. Well, go ahead. And I have a question for you. Why, why would you think I, do you think I'm a storyteller? Do I think you're a storyteller? Yeah. I think you are. Okay, I'll, I'll have to accept that from you. <laughs> okay, next, the next part of the question. Well, well let me just say. Okay. I got you, and, and I really wish my work would get to the center of your core and do all <laughs> What artist does it, you know? I want you crying and crawling on the floor, you know? And I, I, I want you to be gripped by the work, but it doesn't always do that. It, oftentimes it's like, what the hell are you doing? I mean, what, why are you doing that? Or, you know, it, and every now and then someone gets it, and it doesn't, I don't care if everyone gets it. If one person gets it or I'm reciprocating that, with what, that's fine with me. I think I've done what I was trying to do, if, if I can get one person to do that. But I really don't consider myself like a griot or a storyteller because that takes enough energy just to be those things. And I have to spend what energy I have trying to be this so-called artist. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> that, that's still the first. Yeah. Ooh, okay. Well, second, <laughs> second first How do you get there? I mean, what is it that calls you to begin to process, to construct? What is it that calls you and you know that this is, this is the work, this is the art, this is I don't think you really know when you first start off. I think it's kind of like you got to go to the studio. <laughs> I, 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 
you know what I'm saying? You, you got to be there. You got to go to the studio at the Emmy. A lot of times you go there and that studio angel is not there. And crap doesn't happen, you know. But you got to go there. You got to go there and you got to be there all the time. And then eventually you have, I mean, living in society and being subjected to all the things, the media and so forth. I mean, something's going to touch you. Something's going to turn a light on and you're going to think like, yeah, I need to convey something about that. Um, I always say like I'm, I try to be the voice for the voiceless or the, the people that the have nots that cannot do that. But I'm starting to feel like one of those myself. You know, I don't know if everybody, um, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm making enough contact to make a significant difference in how I'm voicing myself and who's receiving that. Because there just aren't enough venues for people of color. There just aren't. I'm lucky. I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad I had that show at the Fine Arts Center. But, like, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be, in three years, I'll be 70. Anybody that's been doing the kind of work that I've been doing that is not of color, they would have already been in other venues and had a, a, a broader voice. Um, I just think that things are changing and things are going to change and eventually more, we need more artists. That's what we need. <laughs> now we, I don't know if it's the artists clapping or whatever, but, but you do. <laughs> but, but, but we do because I'm one individual. I have my own perspective of what I'm doing, but it's not everyone. So I don't speak for all black people. I speak for one African American from his experiences and so forth, and that's all I can really do. That's why we need many more African American artists, women, men, so forth, because there's so many other different experiences that should be out there to give a better picture, to give a whole picture of what's really going on. I'm giving you just a small fragment. We finish? Thank you. <laughs> I'm ready for some more, but go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, but I came in through the end, but I've been listening to you. I can't hear well, but you're an artist, right? So what you're doing, what you're portraying is culture and society, correct? Both matching with uh, Native Americans, whites, and blacks, correct? Everyone. Everyone. Okay, you're an artist and you're dictating your uh, artists and you're writing down what you want. But with the, with the cult situation, how I look at the cult situation, because you're about as age, about the same age as I am, and we grew up with uh, Martin Luther King, Vietnam War, and things of that nature. True. And things have changed now. A hell of a lot have changed. Because you got to consider that you and I grew up without actually computers and the modern age to where where it is now. We have kids now that are doing this, and they know a hell of a lot more, and they can become artists. True. True. That's true. And you want to put things on paper and on campuses and everything else, but it, I look at it as it really changed the culture. Or the society that much? That's I don't know. You know, I think it's overblown to think that what you're doing is going to change society and so forth. I don't go into the studio thinking I'm going to have significant change in society. I really don't. I just, I just have this. It's an obsession. It's a passion. It's, it's something I don't even have control over. I'm going to paint. I'm going to draw. I'm going to do those images, whether they're in a gallery, whether they're in a museum, or whatever. I own the biggest collection of Floyd Tunsons ever. <laughs> That's not a good thing. <laughs> That's not a good thing because I would love to get that work out there f for reasons, for many reasons. Uh, okay, uh, how many I won't discuss the financial aspects that would be wonderful, but I'm not doing it. Some people are training and some people are working to be art, and they're going to sell their art as a commodity. Right. 
It's going to be a commodity. I mean, Yale School of Art is doing that right now. They're anointing many young African-American artists that haven't even graduated that are going to be the, in the top tier, making lots of money without any critical analysis or any career or whatever. Yes. But, but that's, way, that's, that's, that's a different art world. That's when you're doing it for a commodity. If you're doing it for the purposes that you're trying to convey something new or bring something out for humanity and yourself, and I mean, you can do that forever, but the work might be in your storage room for a long time. Oh, yeah, that's you know. very true. Yes. I don't. I don't put a lot of labels on myself. Most people do that themselves. I don't. I don't sit there. I'm a Westerner because uh, um, I'm from Colorado. I don't. I mean, I was born in Denver. You know, born and raised in Denver. I. I never thought of myself as a Westerner because I get out of Colorado. <laughs> I don't just stay in Denver. I don't just stay. I live in Manitou Springs, actually, outside of Colorado Springs, but. I mean, I've traveled. Uh, you got to get out. Of, if you want to be an artist, you got to get out of your little hole now. You can't stay in that little cubby hole forever thinking that you know something about art or even know anything about the world because you don't. So you got to travel and you got to expose yourself. And there's many ways to expose yourself now. I mean, you can go on Google and you'll know something about anything you want to know about. And that, that wasn't at everybody's fingertips at, at one point. So as a, to answer your question, when I first started teaching, um, I would my classes start um, eight o'clock. I'd be done by two thirty. Go home, uh, take a nap, go to bed at three thirty. Get home about three. Take, go to bed at three thirty. Wake up at seven. Go into the studio. Stay in there until about two a.m. in the morning. Go to bed. Wake up at six a.m. Go back through that whole cycle for 30 years. But that's because I was not giving up the art for teaching. Teaching was allowing me actually to do the art. But I had a question. Someone says, well, how did the teaching or how did the students influence your art? They didn't. They didn't. The teaching and the students did not influence my art at all. If anything, I influenced them. And I influenced the art. It wasn't the other way around because I, 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 was, I was driven. I had a passion. I, I knew there was something that I had to do. And I knew nobody was going to do it for me. And I could make all the excuses in the world. Oh, I'm teaching. I, I got to go to work. And I got to do it. Yeah, I did. But I, I, I think the only re way I could have done that for the first 15 years is that I was by myself. The next 15 years, I have family, and that's a different story altogether. But I still came home from work, took a nap, went into the studio, and worked. And then I was so happy when those summers came, where I could actually just keep that schedule up and really build up momentum and be prolific. <clears throat> yes? Just various places, uh, D.C., down south. Uh, I was always going somewhere looking for imagery, and always African Americans. Because um, when I grew up in Denver, I mean, I basically knew most of the African Americans that lived there for a long time. They were, and most of them were relatives, <laughs> cousins, and so forth. All over. But then Denver grew. But then the first time, actually, I got drafted in. As soon as I graduated from college, I got drafted to go uh, in the Army, um, scared shitless. Uh, I signed up for OCS for three years so that I could delay my time going to Vietnam, I thought. And so I was, in, um, I was at Fort Belvoir, right outside of D.C. And so I was always in D.C. But I can tell you, 
I had never seen that many black people not going to a picnic or an event or something, you know, that were just living there. I mean, that was my f first really, I was overwhelmed by all the black, I, I'm from Denver, Colorado, you know, it, it just didn't happen. And then from there, uh, a friend of my mother's from Denver moved to Mississippi. I went down and stayed with her, and then I went all through the Delta um, taking photographs for three years, and then I stopped that, and then back in the year 1995, I started again. And so I was always going looking for subject matter. I wanted subject matter for my paintings, for, my, for everything that I did. And I was looking for black people, and that's where most of those images come from. I will, I will stop anyone. Can I take your picture if I think that I can use it? And I'm not trying to do a wonderful book of portraits or anything. It's all for my own purposes. You know, I'm in there. They're going to be in, in the studio. That's what, that's what I'm getting them for, subject matter, basically. And so those images that you see, um, I don't want to do students. Put them in some work. That's not, it's too close. I want, I, I want it to be someone they don't know, but can identify with. Yes? I didn't get that last part. How do you think the manner in which your work was curated, put up on the wall, or the body of work was chosen, affected your actual work, or what your work was trying to say? <sighs> does that make sense? It does. Uh, but a funny thing about curating work, Blake curated that work, right? But another curator might have curated a whole different show. And I had probably as much work still in storage as, as I had in the show. It's more, much more work than he curated that's still in storage. So I don't think you go through this process, you're, you're actually sick of your own work. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're tired of it. And you're really trying to go somewhere else. You're trying to get out there and, and do something that is new to you and something that's comfortable that you know you can pursue because the worst thing for any artist, I'm sure, is getting comfortable with anything that you do. I mean, once you start getting comfortable, you're dead. You know, you're, it's over. Well, that's a big period in between those works, too. If I can fill in those gaps, and that, I think that's the advantage of having a 40-year retrospective in a place where you, it was done, the, the retrospective at the Fine Arts Center was done in decades. And so you could actually go through the decades and start linking them up, and then you could see that thread that went through all the work. When they're disparate and they're juxtaposed over here and over there, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see that. You can, though, if you carefully, carefully walk through and look at all the pieces, I think at some point you're going to see that there's a common denominator to all of them from that artist. Uh, I actually have a, a tangible response to that uh, from the show in, in, in Colorado Springs. There was um, a work that Kathy mentioned that, and that was in her show in 2005 called The Haitian Dream Boats. And Kathy talked about the, the painting of the guy floating in the water. And you saw the picture of the, actually, I'm just going to back up to that. That's one of the boats, right? Um, in the original piece from 93, maybe? Mm -hmm. 91, 93, something like that? Um, there was the painting, which is about 12 feet long, 14? Four by 12. Uh, eight, eight by 12. Eight, yeah, eight, by, eight feet high by 12 feet long. That's the, that's the image of the guy floating in the water, you know, kind of up, up, up to here. Um, and then there were 12 boats similar to this one. So they essentially just look like a, the skeleton of a boat in front of it, right, kind of leaning on the walls to either side and then dispersed in front of the painting. So you can't actually 
get right up to the painting. There are these boats, and um, it's called Haitian Dream Boats. Well, we had we knew we wanted that in the 2012 show. We had it planned for one space, and then for various reasons, we decided to move it. And my uh, associate curator at that time, Joy Armstrong, who was working with me on the show and, and spending that time with me at Floyd's studio, getting her head into the work too, suggested, well, I know this is totally different than the original layout of the piece, but we had this big, we have this big long atrium area that leads from the front of the building into the galleries, right? This big long soaring space that frankly it's hard as hell to hang any art in. Um, and partially because it's our primary event space and you, you don't want red wine all over the art. But um, we've, we've always thought about things to do in there. And Joy proposed, well, why don't we put the painting at the end of that long corridor, right? So when you come in, you see it, you, 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 you might see it way down there. And then hang the boats from the ceiling all along the way. So you you first greeted with the boats and you follow along to this painting. And I thought, wow, that's really different from, from the original piece, right? Um, and, and it ended up that the painting you don't see down there, it ends up around a corner. So I thought, well, look, we, the best we can do is propose that to Floyd um, because we're not going to do anything with, in the show with the work without talking with Floyd first, because what, what our job is, <laughs> what, you guys, you guys no, remember and, that. And, but seriously, what our job is as a curator is first and foremost to honor the work, right? Honor that place from which the work comes and the intent of the artist. Yeah, we've got all those other things to worry about, like you know, the audience and, and, you know, fundraising and all that kind of business. But um, as I started off with, I mean, it, it's about the art. Um, so we talked with Floyd, we brought him down there and looked at it. And um, his response was, well, there are only 12 boats. You seem to like the idea, but the 12 boats all along that corridor would seem a bit sparse. And your response was, I think I'm going to have to make more boats. <laughs> So over the next six months or so, Floyd made 20, 28 more boats <laughs> to add to the piece. So ultimately, when we put that label up on the wall, it said 1993 slash 2012, right? Because part of it was brand new. So you followed these 28 boats all along the corridor, you rounded the corner, and then whammo, there's the, there's the painting with the 12 boats right in front of it, just as the original piece was. So it maintained that original intent, and then expanded it for a whole new building, for a whole new audience, and uh, those boats are still hanging in that corridor, and people love it, and, and, and they get it. You know, it'd be nice to have that painting still around there, but now those boats by themselves take on a whole new personality. And, um, you know, I've always believed that, at least in terms of, of contemporary art, uh, you know, if we're going to be exhibiting contemporary art, you know, work, work by living artists, and we're going to be working with those artists on the show rather than just going to a gallery and working with the gallery and selecting the work from there. We're going to be working with the artists. One thing that I'm tremendously interested in is the development of new work as relates to the show, right? Um, and that's a, that's a good example of it. And, and there's an example of it right now down there with one of Floyd's students, a guy named Andy Tirado, right? Fantastic artist. Um, but for his show, he spent this past summer in the middle of the gallery making a new work, which was, it was down there every day. You could walk in there, you could talk with him, you could interact with him. You basically got a, a sort of behind the scenes look into the, into the studio. And, and 
you know, you don't know the end result. You don't know what he's going to end up with. You have an idea because he'd done sort of study uh, drawings around the walls. But he didn't know what was going to happen because that's not the way it works, right? You know, he knew where he was going to start. He knew when he had to have something done, but he didn't know what that would be exactly. And so, again, now the finished work, finished sculpture is there hanging in the middle of the gallery. And it's fantastic and, and you know, people love it. So that's, that's something I'm very interested in from a curatorial standpoint in terms of working with the art is finding those opportunities in which you, you yeah, you're, you're exhibiting and you're contextualizing that, that work that's already been done and you're bringing it in front of people, uh, but you have that opportunity too for something new to happen that might not have happened, that wouldn't have happened otherwise. It's like an incubator, pressure. All the artists know when you have to do your critiques and so forth, you know, you did it the night before and stuff, but it's still pressure. I'll say, I'll say one more thing on that. One more quick thing on that. As a, as a younger curator, um, <laughs> one of the smartest things I ever read was from an, from an art critic. And, and that, that can be a rarity. Uh, but he was lamenting the fact that places like um, a large art museum elsewhere in the state of Colorado, not Colorado Springs, had, for all intents and purposes, stopped exhibiting regional artists. Maybe historic ones, but not living, working artists. And he said the problem with that is you work with an artist, you give them uh, the right artist, the right opportunity, the right space, the right curatorial vision, and some things can, amazing can happen that never would have happened otherwise, right? And an institution who stopped doing that has shut off the development of, of new art. I've always remembered that. And, and the Fine Arts Center has always been really good at that balance of, you know, really significant historic and contemporary regional art and, you know, when, when possible, other work from all over the world and, and, and nationally. And, it, you know, it was that way when Kathy was there. Uh, we've tried to maintain that um, since I've been there. But that statement has always stuck, stuck with me that, you, you know, you, as soon as you eliminate that, you, you've, you've, you've stifled the development of new art. I don't. <laughs> I've I've lost that. You know, you you can't you can't be your you know, you can't toot your own horn. You can't create your own show. Usually somebody does that, and. I mean, you don't have to agree with everything that they decide that they're going to put in the show, and there's a lot of discussion and going back and forth, and no, that's not going in there, and that shouldn't be in there, and yes, that should be in there, and so, I mean, but basically somebody else does that. I don't want to, I mean, an individual piece or something for a show or something, when you're trying to make a statement, or if you're in a group show, I think you have a lot more control over that. Um, let me get somebody else. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if uh, the 2008 recession, uh, uh, how it, is, if it affected you personally and generally emerging artists and artists that were, uh, you know, not terribly well known, somewhat well known, if it affected uh, the fundraising and any profit it did. Everybody knows when the economy goes in the toilet, the art is the first to go after that, you know, because... It affected my attitude toward buying. It's, oh, it affected everything. I mean, like you said, there was no fundraising for... There weren't a lot of shows going on in a lot of museums, and they were, go, they were struggling. In Colorado Springs, they were struggling also. Everybody, once the economy went in the toilet, everybody was struggling. But personally... I think individuals were struggling too. You know, I mean, um, it's, it's, 
I don't personally. I've maintained over that period, you know, like I think everyone else has, but I think we're not, we're not uh, high enough on the tier yet to, to say things are getting better. Um, we hope that things are getting better and it appears that things are getting better, but I haven't directly been affected by that yet because I'm just a poor artist, basically. I wish I, wish I was somebody where that did affect me. <laughs> you know, but it didn't really affect me that much in that for my own personal endeavors, you know, uh, no money. Not selling any art and of course the, the storeroom is fuller. <laughs> Nothing's going out. Yes. Just recently, if you do a 40 year retrospective, I can tell you once that show gets together and what you have to go through to do that, you're not going to get a lot of work done after that. You're going to be burnt. <laughs> so I'm just now actually just recently in the last three months or something where I just got back in the studio and starting to get some momentum back and starting to address things that I've been wanting to do for years. But I was crippled after that show. I must admit that. Yes. Nah, it's my salvation, it's my sanctuary. Um, I think the art is what keeps you afloat when you really, if you're really sincere and you're really into your art, I think your art alone can keep you afloat, really. I mean, I, don't, I know that sounds corny and everybody said, oh, bullshit, you know. <laughs> How's the art gonna keep you afloat? You gotta, but you also gotta, I don't know, I mean, that old saying that, uh, you know, I'm a struggling poor artist. That's not hip anymore. You know, you want to be able to pay your bills. You want to be able to eat. You got to know where that meal's coming from. You got to have things in order because if your life is not in order, I don't see where you're going to be able to create on a consistent basis. I mean, you're going to be up and down. You're going to be on that roller coaster, and that's more frustrating than anything. I think the most frustrating thing is not to be able to do the art. No matter what level you're doing it, you don't have to be doing eight by 12 paintings or whatever. You just have to be doing, proceeding and growing in whatever it is that you're, you're pursuing. And if you do that, I, I think, I think um, the art saves me. The art has saved me. I mean, without that, I'd be a lost soul. Yes. I didn't. <laughs> Those, that's, that's all I depend on. You know, to, my friends and family, they say, Floyd is great. I love it. That's all I need to hear. You know, I go back in the studio and I'm, they said they loved it. My mom loves the painting. You know, I'm, I'm going back in and do more of those. But. Connections. <laughs> No, no, basically what happened is if, if you're sincere about what you're, you're doing, eventually somebody's going to notice. Somebody's going to notice. It might not be the somebody you want or, you know, uh, I'm not in New York or, or anywhere, but, but, but I was in the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center. And I mean, for me, that was plenty at the time. Yeah, I would like to do bigger and better things, but somebody's going to notice. I was in like, I used to belong to galleries, like in Denver. I started off with the Robichon Gallery in Denver and then moved up, left that, went to Sandy Carson, the Van Stratton, and so forth. But I sold nothing. 
I was attached to galleries. They had control over me, but I had no money. They were making money. I didn't have any money. For the last six, seven years, I haven't belonged to a gallery. And it's fine. You don't have to belong to a gallery. You don't need recognition through a gallery or something, but you need to be sincere about the work you're doing. And if you really are, somebody's going to notice. Or you start off in co-ops, or you start, we had a lot of allied artists, you know, where a lot of artists got together to put up shows and so forth. It's not always an individual gallery name or something, but if you're really sincere about what you're going to do, you go in there and pay your dues, I think you'll reap the benefits. Sir? What made you want to share your artwork? I never did. <laughs> Nothing made me want to share my artwork. No, of course, every artist in here wants to share their artwork. What do you do? Do it in a void? <laughs> what, 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 what would be the purpose of not sharing it? You definitely want to share it. How else is anybody going to know about it? How is anybody going to emote to it? How is anybody going to relate to it? How are you going to get those that that's crap or that's wonderful? I mean, you're not going to get any response if you don't share it. Let me try somebody else because you get ready to tear me up. Yes, again. Where your beginning work. Did you donate some of your work to even friends or, or just places that you knew that people walk by, they just stop at that moment and look at that piece? I mean, how do you feel? If you, did you ever donate your work? And if you did, how did that make you feel knowing that you wasn't not yet to be known? And that one person has that one piece that you donated. Actually, I didn't, I'm not one to do a lot of donating of the artwork. Um, because if you are decent, people are going to be wanting you for uh, different auctions and different things. They're going to be asking you for your work. But I'm not real hip in donating a lot of art. I think you should not donate your work. I think that's the problem, is people think that artists can donate work. We're, we're serious people. We want to get paid. If you want the work, pay for it. If not, sit on it. Keep it in storage. Don't, don't be friendly. Don't be out there donating your work to anything. Make them pay for it if they want it, or, or donate it to someone that's, that's meaningful to you. Don't just be donating your work. I, I don't recommend that. And I'm not one that, I don't have a pot to piss in, so don't listen to me. If you want to make some money, maybe you might have to donate some work to prime the pump. I don't know what that's all about. Donating work, does it open a window? Does it? 50 shot, you feel like would it open a window to be successful or even to put out I don't think it has anything to do with being successful, whether you donate work or not. I, re I don't think they have anything to do with each other. Don't donate your work. Okay. Okay. <laughs> don't do that. Yes. I'm just, oh, yes. I do. So I'm just curious, what, what um, mediums do you feel most comfortable working with, or is there something that you work with? If I was, if I was stuck with, with a pencil <laughs> and a piece of paper or a pencil and canvas, I like to draw on canvas, by the way, but if I was just stuck with a piece of graphite, I would be fine. I mean, I'm comfortable just drawing. And is, when I'm not, when I've been out of art, like for all these months or whatever, the first thing I do to get back in is I go in and I, I draw. I do a lot of drawing, a lot of drawing, because drawing is the basis for all this stuff. If, if you can draw well, you probably can paint well, you probably can, you're probably a good photographer, you're probably everything, because they're all, they're all encompassing in that basic thing of being able to draw, compose, so forth. But if you can draw well, everything else kind of falls in place, I think, for me. I'm speaking as Floyd Tunson. I don't know if that works for everybody out here. Oh, question. question, my man. Because, like, again, you and I are the same age, and you're an artist. How old are you? You keep saying we're the same age. You might be. Uh, how old are you? I'm 63 years old. We ain't the same age. Okay, how old are you? 67. Well, well, you're a baby. We're, we're okay. Okay. 
I keep saying we just, I wish I was 63. <laughs> Did you feel that you had to isolate yourself and come with yourself to try to start making the images? Yes. Period? Are you doing, oh, like I said, I wish we were uh, we were seeing some of your work right now, but are you looking at the beginning, middle, and end that we're doing right now within generation between generation? Am I, am I doing that? Yes. No. Okay, where are your generation? How are you working at this as an artist? Are you going from the beginning to the end or in the middle? I'm all of those things. I mean, I can't shake what I learned in the beginning. I can't shake what I learned in the right. middle. It's all who I am now. Mm -hmm. So I'm not consciously trying to do that, but, you know, subconsciously okay. those you things are coming right. out. You had to be within yourself to do these uh, crimes and stuff like you that? You always have to be within yourself. Most artists go in, that's why we have studios. Right. This is not a spectator sport. This is not something <laughs> you bring somebody else in for opinions and stuff. It's a it's a pretty lonely existence actually. Yeah, it's a lonely existence, so actually, but it's a wonderful lonely so you existence. Have to actually, get yourself out of society and think what you want to do and paint, and hopefully you can go from that direction. Yeah, well, usually, like she was mentioning, I do a lot of different things. Usually, if I have a concept, there are certain things that can be executed in different media's. Mm -hmm. I'm not one to. I'm not just a painter. Right. Um, if a concept comes up, it might work better in mixed media. Mm -hmm. Might work best in photography. It might be a combination of things, but right. I try to um, express yourself with, 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 with whatever media that expresses my concept. Express your concept, see if it was in the past or the future. Or am I kind of weighing out a little bit different that way? Or are you looking You're stretching the it. Or are you sitting in the middle? I don't know where I am. Okay. I don't want to know where I am. <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying, right? I mean, if I know where I am, I'm stuck. Right. You know, I mean. You do get stuck sometimes. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, you do. Uh, oh, we all get stuck. Oh, everybody's going to get stuck. You, they, they know that. They, they, everybody, oh, you get stuck. Oh, yes. That's, that's called artistic block or something, right? No, it just, you're stuck. <laughs> you're stuck. Oh, anyway, anything you do in life, you get to that point where you get stuck and go, really? But as an artist... For it's, me, it's, it's the process. It's a, I love the process. Right. I love doing the process. I, the, the final work, I mean, I have no clue what that's going to really look like, but mm -hmm. I love the process of getting there. It's and, getting and it's painful sometimes, and you get stuck in the process. Oh, yeah, you yeah. always do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I go to the I go to the hills. I go to the mountains. I either go skiing or I go hiking or I just go to the hills. And then when I come back, I'm not stuck. <laughs> yes. So for you coming to the studio and being in there every day and everything seems like I'm not in there every day, that'd be a fallacy. Oh yeah, I go to the studio every day. <laughs> Bullshit. But, What's the next step? Where, where do you go as to you know, getting art out there? What do you do after you create it? I do nothing. <laughs> I put it in storage. I just, I'm finished and I take it down and few people come over and say, can I see what you've done new? And I show it to them and then it goes in storage, and then maybe somebody like Blake or somebody else might come out of the woodwork and say, I'd like to look at your work, and I heard something about you, or this and that, and then we might start a process of curating something for a small show, or just a piece, or something, you know, I don't know, it, but I, you cannot be the business person and the artist too, okay? You can get somebody to represent you, and then you just do the art. And I know that sounds really lofty and crap. It could be your grandma. It doesn't matter. Let somebody else do the business. You know, if you, it takes as much work to do the business as the art, especially in the art world, because you don't want to start negotiating for your work because you'll probably end up choking somebody or beating them up, you know, because it's not negotiable. You don't want to be in that process. That's not for the artist. Yes. 
No, I've been doing this since I was five. Okay. There you go. And so, have you kept all the things from when you were little? No. <laughs> I wish I had that insight. <laughs> hey, put those in the box. Put them over there. You know, all my little drawings from, from elementary school that I thought was so wonderful. And, and my first oil painting in junior high school on the on the window shade. I wish I had that, you know. I didn't have a clue of, of archival or holding on to anything. I was I was an artist. I didn't have any clue that I should be holding on to my work. And for the show that was at the Fine Arts Center, I could have done another show at the same time with the same amount of work. And I don't know how much work I I've never I don't know. Somebody knows though. Somebody takes care of that and goes through there and, you know, they have an inventory and stuff like that, but, yeah, somebody does that and I don't go, how much work do I have now? So, so, uh, <laughs> Floyd, you have 110 pieces in reserve. I don't know. Well, that's such a weird question, you know, for an artist. <laughs> do I have kids? Yeah, I have two daughters. Okay, that's good. Because I was thinking about what you were saying right now. Some artists, you know, they're dead now. And they're <laughs> <laughs> gotta <consider>. Profound. <laughs> Profound. <laughs> you gotta consider that their paintings were worth five dollars when they were alive, and now they're worth millions. So make sure you keep those paintings in storage. I won't give a rat piss what they're worth when I'm gone. I can tell you that. <laughs> You had a question? Uh, yeah, so I know when I create my art, I'm very involved in the process. And I love the process. So, yeah. Yeah. That's part, but are you ever surprised by the end product? Like, I, are you ever like, whoa, I, I did that just now? I'm always, I think for any concept that you come up with and when you try to execute it, I think it's as good as you thought it was going to be, and usually it's better. It's always better. It's always, that's the process. All those surprises and the result that you think, shit, did I do that? <laughs> I did that? Yeah. But that, that's, that's enough to make you want to keep doing it. You want to see that next, you want that next aha moment. You, that's, that's what drives you, you know, every time. And, and that's what makes your work better and better and better because you're your worst critic. You know, people say, give me some of your, your work that you don't like or it's not work. That's in somebody else's trash can. Are you kidding me? I can't give you that. That's, uh, the only thing an artist has is his reputation. That's, that's all you have. And so don't be giving that brand X work to people. Oh, I don't like this, but you can have it. If you don't like it, either work on it to, to like it or tear it up and put it in somebody else's trash can. But don't. Don't give out work that you think is awful, because that represents you. That's your reputation. That's you. You put some effort in that and time, and maybe it didn't work out. Well, throw it away. You don't have to keep it. Yes? Yeah. It's really something you have to, as an artist, accept that you're going to have to do this and be It's It's crippling when you think that everything you produce is, is wonderful. Because it isn't. You do some, some awful things, you know? And that's what keeps you up all night, trying to make it not awful so that you can wake up to it tomorrow, you know? You go in there and you're working on a piece and everything is wonderful, and all of a sudden you put in some stroke that throws the whole shit off. It's 2 a.m. in the morning. You're tired as hell. You want to go to bed. But you know you cannot wake up and come into the studio and see that. And there you are. It, pretty soon it's 4.30 a.m. and you're getting in the bed, but you corrected something. And then you, wait, you can't wait to wake up tomorrow and go in there and see where you left off so you can proceed. But you know that you're your worst critic. And when the, if it's not right for you, it's not right. I don't care if somebody comes, that's so wonderful. You know, <laughs> no, it's not. It's awful. And I'm, and I'm going to just saw it out, you know. Yeah. Don't do that. 
you know. But yeah, you have to be, you have to come to grips with yourself. You know, I know your parents and people around you, oh, you're so gifted. And don't, don't believe the hype. You're not gifted. <laughs> most of this is labor. You might be gifted, but most of it is just pure labor, work. You got to work. If you're not willing to do that, I, I don't know what you're going to be as an artist. A lazy one. <laughs> yes. Did you always want to be an artist? I did before I even knew what an artist was. I used to say, because my brother, I used to say, when I grow up, I want to be an artist. And that, I, was, I was about five when I said that. When I grow up, I want to be an artist. And I just always said I wanted to be an artist. And I did. I'm just one of the few people probably that said that that really meant it, but didn't know. I didn't know what an artist was. I mean, I knew they were drawing and painting and so forth, you know, and, but, I've always wanted to be an artist, my whole life. Yes? Uh, you said that you learned uh, how to draw and paint by watching your brothers. Do you have any other mentors in your life? Uh, mentors? Yeah, I had some teachers through college. Yeah, I would say, yeah, I had other mentors that were very influential. But I think he was the top, it's my brother. Yes. Um, okay, so you were a teacher so that you could be an artist. Did you teach art or were you teaching? Yeah, I did. That's that's the most compatible thing you can do as an artist is yeah. teach art. <laughs> you know. So to children or high school in the IB program at Palmer High School in Colorado Springs. So, Are you still in touch with any of your students? Few <laughs> You think if you're teaching for like 30 years and you have about 300 students a year, you will start multiplying that by 30 and you think, I'm not in touch with many. I see people that I, I know I know them, but I've, I've expunged those names a long time ago. Did anybody stand out to you? Oh, absolutely. I have students. He was just talking about one, Andy Torado. I have Phil Vallejo, Chris Weed. I can name a lot of students that are really successful artists and really are profound and wonderful artists. I have some, I, those are the people I stay in touch with, the ones that are really meaningful to me. Because they really delved into the art. They were, they were serious. Yeah. They were serious. Sir. I don't know much about the Haitian Ori shells. Give me the scoop. Uh, the, the no. Okay. No. Yeah, but that's based. That's just based on something that's ephemeral in a dream or something. You know, that's not going to actually be real. But they want to escape that island. But you know, they very seldom make it. And if they do make it to the United States, they return. So it's that. It's that. A kind of middle passage of never making it. That's that's basically what the Haitian dream boats are about. But I don't pretend to know anything about voodoo or anything else because I don't. I wish I did. I put a spell on you all right now. Well, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I'm really, I'm really glad for that. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Way in the back. <laughs> Who's your favorite child? <laughs> I can't, I can't answer that. I don't have a favorite color. Okay, you try that. I do not. I do not. Yes. He did. He did. He was a sculptor. Yeah. But he could draw, he could paint, he could do architectural renderings. I don't know what he couldn't do. I think that's probably why 
I tried to do so many things because he did so many things. And I just, you know, I loved his dirty underwear. And I was always, <laughs> you know, I'm hanging on him all the time and around him. And, uh, kind of like a competition no competition at all. He was light years ahead of me. Are you kidding? <laughs> competition. He would laugh. But, but he had a heavy influence on things I did and how I, uh, my critical analysis of things. I remember in the fourth grade, uh, the teacher, we were doing dinosaurs, right? And so we were all making dinosaurs out of clay, and I did this Tyrannosaurus Rex, and we were getting ready to fire them. And, and you know, the Tyrannosaurus Rex had the eyes, you know, like the indentations on the side of the, the head, right? And I had studied and done all this, and then the teacher comes up to me just before we are getting ready to fire the thing. She says, hey, Floyd, uh, your dinosaur doesn't have any eyes. And so she paints these eyes on the forehead. You know, she puts, she puts two eyes on the forehead. And so the, the piece gets fired and everything, and, you know, everybody's going home with their little pieces in the shoebox and stuff. And I'm going down the street, and I'm going home, and my brother comes out of the yard going to his car, you know, and I see him, you know. And I got this dinosaur in the box, and I'm, I'm just upset that the teacher put the eyeballs on the forehead, right? <laughs> she thought she was doing me a favor. Floyd, you forgot the eyes, you know. She puts them on there, and I see my brother, and he's coming out. Hey, Floyd, what you got? You know, he's, he's excited, and he's always giving me encouragement and so forth. Hey, Floyd, what you got? I take the dinosaur out of the, the box and I look at him and I throw it up against the curb and just splatter the whole thing. I didn't want him to see that. That's how critical I was about the work that I was doing and how he would perceive me as an artist, you know. I didn't want him to think I'm that guy that puts eyeballs on the forehead or something, <laughs> you know. So yeah, he had a heavy influence on me, heavy. Are you gonna have another uh, showing? I am. My next show will be up in Billings, Montana next spring at the Yellowstone Art Museum. Like I said, I'd like to bless you. Like, I apologize I didn't see your art. But... You don't have to apologize for not seeing my you art. What? Because you and I are probably sitting around, look at we debate and go, really? <laughs> go, go to the show downtown. What? Go to the 516 on Saturday. Where? It'll be there until December. Oh, really? Yeah, it's... Well, go see it in person. You don't want to see it on. Yeah, uh, I like that's nothing. It. Go see it in person. So I can look at it and see Do I have any more questions? One more. How do you, as a curator, meet each other? Somebody, uh, a, a person that does all my business, and um, I told her to contact him. Remember, he said that uh, Floyd Thompson would like to talk to you. you know? <laughs> Uh, a friend of mine that's, that takes care of all my business and stuff, she contacted Blake, and then Blake contacted me, and then he came to my studio to take a peek, and, and he got stuck. <laughs> he was just coming to peek. You know, oh, I'll give him, I'll go to your studio. Oh, yeah, okay. You know, he was just being the curator guy. <clears throat> so if there are no more questions, Thank you for enduring, and I hope you go to the show.